All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this NJ MMA virtual information session. My name is Jillian Barrick. I'm the business administrator for the town of Morristown and a member of the NJ MMA executive board. And I will be your moderator. Uh, today we have with us uh, Ms. Sheila Oliver, the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of New Jersey. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few excerpts from her bio. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Oliver is a self-described Jersey girl born and raised in an ethnically diverse Newark neighborhood. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Oliver was inspired as a young girl to be a fighter for the voiceless when her eyes were open to societal injustices and inequities around her, often citing a tale of two cities as her youth awakening. She has since pioneered a successful career in public service, advocating for social justice, women's equality, and education, ultimately becoming the first woman of color to serve in a statewide elected office in New Jersey history. In addition to her role as Lieutenant Governor, she serves as Commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs, where she has led efforts to strengthen and expand initiatives for fair and affordable housing, community revitalization, homelessness prevention, and local government services that support New Jersey's 565 municipalities. Across her career, Lieutenant Governor Oliver has worked in the public, nonprofit, and private sectors and has taught numerous college courses. A trailblazer in every sense of the word, in 2010, she became the first African-American woman in state history to serve as assembly speaker and just the second in the nation's history to lead a state le legislative house. She's a proud 40 plus year resident of East Orange where she treasures her time with her 93 year old grandma, 93 year old mother who has always encouraged her to be a critical thinker while fostering her passion for helping people through effective public policy. I'm very happy to have Lieutenant Governor join our group today and on behalf of the executive board of NJMMA, we thank you for your time and we welcome you. Lieutenant Governor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jillian. And I want to thank uh, everyone at NJMMA for extending an invitation to me to you know, just share with you this afternoon. Um, many of you know that I have spent uh, a majority of my career working in the public sector, particularly working in local government. And I have often said, that uh, the municipal level of government is probably the most critical connection that government has with, uh, with people. Uh, at, at the local city hall, you are uh, open up and your doors are opened up to almost every constituent, every issue that is out there. And then in addition to that, as local government, you also have to be responsive to so many quasi-governmental agencies uh, at the county, state, and uh, federal level. So I tip my hat off to everyone that uh, has uh, committed themselves, their knowledge and their expertise to running our local governments. And what uh, a ride it has been this past year working in local government. Uh, we know that we all acknowledged in some way uh, just the other day, our one year COVID-19 anniversary. And uh, when we look back at where we were last March, uh, many of us had no inkling whatsoever that we would be confronted with the challenges that, that we were, but we, but we are. Um, one of the things that I would like to do today is just touch upon some of the things that may be of interest to, to those of you that are in a local government, because you know, in my role as commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs, uh, under that umbrella is the Division of Local Government Services. And I know that each and every one of you is familiar with LGS. Uh, we just had a uh, change in leadership in local government services. Uh, Melanie Walter, who many of you had worked with, uh, I, I asked her if she would assume the um, leadership at the New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Agency. Um, she is a perfect uh, fit to take the helm from Chuck Richmond, and many of you worked with Chuck through the years. Chuck made a decision to retire, even though I tried to block him at the front door. Uh, but Melanie has taken the helm of a of, of, uh, Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency. And Jacqueline Suarez is the new director of local government services. Uh, she is an attorney by trade. She is not um, 
unfamiliar with us at the Department of Community Affairs. Uh, when the Murphy administration uh, took office in 2018, uh, Jacqueline had been, had been working as the Director of Legislative Services, sort of like legislative uh, liaison to the legislature. And all the pieces of legislation that would be um, introduced and filed, uh, Jacqueline's job at DCA uh, was to uh, you know, do an analysis of legislation and then to work with legislators to make determinations whether or not it uh, effectuated or implicated, harmed or helped our department. Subsequently, she was asked by uh, former governor's chief counsel, Matt Platkin, to come and work uh, in chief counsel's office. And uh, she did that uh, up until January 11th, when I was able to steal her back away from general counsel's office. I think many of you will find it um, very refreshing and uh, great. Uh, you'll have a great relationship uh, with Jacqueline. But you know, in 2021, uh, Governor Murphy allocated $10 million to promote uh, shared services through the establishment of what we call the LEAP program, Local Efficiency Achievement Program. And that uh, program consists of a challenge grant, implementation grant, and funding for a county coordinator fellowship initiative. Let me tell you a little bit about the challenge grants. The challenge grants uh, allocate funds uh, for the most compelling projects in potentially each of New Jersey's 21 counties. Uh, the 2021 challenge grant period uh, closed on February 26. Uh, applications are now currently uh, under review by the Division of Local Government Services staff. Uh, the implementation grants uh, are being accepted until June 30th of 2021. The County Coordinator Fellowship Grants, uh, those funds were awarded to each county that applied for a grant. There are still many counties that uh, didn't take advantage and apply. However, uh, counties can still do so at any time. A LEAP Fellowship Training will take place in Trenton at DCA, uh, and uh, we will be doing that in April. So I would encourage folks to apply for that. And our thinking in terms of the fellowships is making certain that we invest in building a bench of future uh, governmental leaders. Uh, many of us uh, have been around you know, for a long time, and we're beginning to see, even in our state government, that many people are now choosing to take advantage of the hard work that they have invested. And they're saying, well, it's time for me to throw the towel in and retire. We hate to lose that institutional knowledge and, and that leadership and just the expertise that some of our veteran governmental leaders uh, bring to the table. And we know that uh, we need to begin to, as I said, build a bench so that uh, as governmental leaders, um, we are able to make certain that we continue um, you know, a, a, a legacy and to continue that knowledge base. We all know what um, a challenge it is when you have someone who has worked in your government for a long time and they depart. So that is what the, the grants uh, are, are uh, focused on. And you know the issue of shared services, uh, that's been around a long time. And some municipalities um, have taken advantage of opportunities to do shared services, others have not. You know that um, we've got our uh, tumultuous team, I call them Platt and Glatt, but two former mayors who Governor Murphy had asked to step up and assume leadership as our quote, shared services czars. Many of you uh, on the Zoom today may have had one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with Mayors uh, Platt and Glatt uh, to try to work through the issues that um, really represent barriers to municipalities coming together uh, to do shared services. 
But I will tell you more and more municipalities are beginning to um, come forward and want to do shared services. We're all beginning to deal with the reality of um, reduced rateables. Many of us still are unable to project what a COVID-19 year has done to us uh, fiscally at the local level. And uh, we're all going to be looking for innovative and creative ways um, to maximize the resources that we have. Uh, the other initiative that we created last year, which I love tremendously, is something that we call the lab, the local assistance board. And the lab provides comprehensive uh, engagement and consulting services for uh, municipalities at high levels. Uh, we came to understand during our three and a half year tenure thus far that of our 565 municipalities, everyone is at a different stage of uh, management expertise, of problem solving, and of experience. And you all know that local government services is comprised of some of the most veteran governmental uh, leaders uh, that we've had in our states. Uh, we've got former BAs, former CFOs, uh, those who have been uh, engaged in uh, municipal audit work through their careers. And through the lab, uh, we want to offer assistance at no cost to our municipalities to help you problem solve any challenge that you potentially could have. If you are seeking to do bonding deals, if you're seeking to do refinancing, um, even if you're seeking to do a training with your local governing bodies. One of the things that uh, we were initially proud to develop was uh, opportunities for local governments to work with the Rutgers Graduate School of Management and Administration to offer training. Uh, you know that uh, our division is uh, the overseer of what we call the MISRA law, the law uh, that was created in order to intercede and prevent the city of Atlantic City from going into bankruptcy. Through that experience, and not just in Atlantic City, but in other municipalities that we work with, we learn that you know, your local governing bodies, some are veteran governing bodies, others may see a lot of turnover every four year cycle. And there were different levels of, um, of, of knowledge about the operations of local government. So one of the things that we did through the lab was establish a, a sort of like a training academy for new or veteran members of your municipal councils. Uh, those sessions uh, have proven to be extremely, extremely helpful to many municipalities. We all know the challenge of uh, balancing out the role and the authorities of administration versus the local governing bodies. Uh, it's a proverbial tug and back and forth we've had probably since local government began. But in these days and times with so many challenges that we have at the municipal level, it is extremely important that we understand that the governing body is not the administration and the administration is not the governing body. And we think that uh, the, the curriculum that we put together and the expertise of the staff that we assigned to conduct those sessions uh, are very are very good, um, and also it all I think the, the the lab and taking advantage of the services of the lab, uh, you know, brings in professional expertise and knowledge and skill sets and insights that sometimes can bring a fresh perspective to uh, challenges and maybe progressive outlooks to solve a problem in a different way. Um, and the advisors, as I said, are all former municipal officials. So they know the challenges, they know how you have to navigate you know, the landscape and uh, they can help you with, with all levels of administration, finance and purchasing, uh, human resources, which sometimes gets to be a challenge and even bringing expertise to the table to assist you in your labor negotiations with poli police dispatch communications, public safety, public works, risk management, you name it. 
the lab can help. And then lastly, I just wanna to touch upon uh, the CARES Act. Many of you uh, were able to be the direct recipient of CARES Act funding. Uh, others uh, were able to um, work collaboratively with your counties that may have uh, received direct community development block grant money uh, to address issues related to COVID-19. Uh, but uh, we were able to um, accept applications from local units of government for funding under the CARES Act. And um, we know that uh, we're getting ready to get another tranche of CARES Act funding. We don't know the numbers specifically yet. This morning we were on a call with uh, the governor's office in DC and uh, they are putting a, a, a document together for us so we can anticipate what New Jersey might particularly uh, receive. One thing that we are all thrilled about is that the American Rescue Plan has made provision to provide funding to states and to localities. That is something that we, we fought for um, vigorously uh, in Washington because we knew that for our local governments to move along uh, effortlessly uh, as we pull out of the pandemic, they needed direct financial support. Uh, we did process uh, 221 applications and this is under the original CARES funding and we dispersed between 59 to $60 million um, in uh, COVID uh, relief uh, funding. Uh, FAST, I just wanna give a, a quick update on FAST. You know, we went uh, painfully through the implementation of the FAST system. I want you to know that it is pretty much, uh, the update is going very well. And we've added over 250 fire districts uh, to uh, the FAST system as well. I know that many of you at, your, at the local level are confronted with landlords and tenants who have gone uh, for a year under a moratorium. I want to assure you in my secondary role as, uh, or I, I, I say my primary role as commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs that we have focused uh, exclusively on how we can bring relief to tenants uh, within uh, our state and most importantly to landlords. We did launch through both the Department of Community Affairs and the HMFA, several programs to bring uh, assistance to landlords. Through our New Jersey Redevelopment Authority, we also launched uh, a couple of programs to provide rental relief to your small business owners because providing rental uh, relief to the small business owners absolutely took a level of burden off their shoulder, but at the same time, it helped keep commercial landlords whole. Uh, we are about to uh, launch uh, a second wave of programming that will provide even greater assistance to small business owners and to landlords. We learned a lot from uh, the first tranche of programs. We are seeking to uh, minimize the bureaucracy which oftentimes uh, got in the way of some of our small business owners going through the application process. And um, the New Jersey Redevelopment Authority uh, has worked in tandem with uh, EDA to provide relief to business owners um, and the owners of properties of up to three units that often house small businesses. So we'll be launching those programs in the next several weeks. Uh, the, the governor did announce today that um, the next wave of our COVID relief rental assistance program uh, will be launched on Monday. We will have a week's period in which we will uh, accept applications. I think the important thing to note is that a landlord can apply for rental assistance on behalf of his or her tenant. And if you visit the uh, New Jersey Division of, Commu of Community Housing and Resources website, you will be able to uh, learn 
how a landlord could do that. And with that, I'm going to stop and allow time for Q&A uh, to try to respond that things that are of interest to you and uh, to have an opportunity to hear what is important for you. And uh, thank you, Jillian, for giving me this opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, thank you again for your time this morning. And I'm sure that we have a number of questions. Um, I would ask attendees if you have a question, if you would please raise your hand, which you can do using the, uh, the raise your hand button at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Uh, and we'll be able to address your questions. Uh, we have our first hand raised. Um, we actually have a few hands raised. Um, Michael, if you'll allow them to speak and then we'll address, have each question addressed. Uh, Anthony Ferreira, you're the first question. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for spending time with us today. And thanks, uh, Julian, as, as a NJMA board member. Um, again, Anthony Ferreira, Hillsborough Township and also Vice President of uh, NJMA. Uh, my question to you, Lieutenant Governor, and again, if you don't have the answer, obviously, maybe we can get back to the, the entire group but it's around Assembly Bill um, A4850, the Expedited Inspections Bill. I'm just trying to find out what initiated um, Assemblyman uh, Karabinchek uh, really to initiate the bill um, as a method, method for developers or builders to obtain the required construction inspections uh, more rapidly. Um, I know, I didn't know if there's any consideration made uh, for achieving the same under the UCC code currently where they do allow for overtime to hire additional people. And in your opinion, if the bill is adopted, what accountability would be made for the local municipality uh, with the outside inspection agency? So that's my question. Actually more than one question, but a couple in there, but thank you. Not, not a problem, Anthony. So I would say dating back to late 2018, uh, early 2019, well really early 2018, is uh, when uh, we began to interface with the assemblymen around this bill. Uh, when the bill was first filed, of course, because we're codes and standards, we had uh, concerns about the implementation of such a bill. Uh, we have since early 2018 up to the present begun to work uh, in a collaborative way with Assemblyman Karabanchik to try to address his concerns while at the same time, not upsetting what we think is a good system at the local level. So when you ask what uh, motivated uh, him to introduce that bill, you know, he comes from a background of the construction industry and he began to hear uh, from many developers or construction groups that they were having difficulty uh, in the in the in the quick quick inspection and permitting process, um, things for instance that you know several towns may share uh, code officials and you know it would take a longer length of time uh, for them to get around to certain projects. Uh, he raised concerns about some towns not having availability five days a week, maybe two days in one town, one day in another town. So, you know, the, the bill has not moved forward. We have not uh, totally, you know, embraced or endorsed the legislation. And we are trying to work with the assemblyman to address the concerns that he has within the context of what currently exists. But that is the history of the bill. Uh, the bill has not yet moved forward. We have not reached consensus, but Ed Smith, uh, our codes, uh, and standards director is continuing to work very closely. Interestingly, uh, Jacqueline Suarez, our new director of local government services was the uh, attorney in DCA that initially was uh, working with that, uh, with, with that bill when it was introduced. So uh, we're on top of it, have not met with any resolve yet. Okay, thank you, appreciate the update. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next question uh, comes from uh, Chris Voss. If you'll unmute yourself and uh, address your question, please. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Governor and Julian. Uh, Chris Voss, Borough Administrator from the Borough of Seaside Heights. 
I was very happy to read this morning that the governor issued a statement that he supports amending Senate Bill 3454 to allow for parental notification in cases of underage possession of uh, cannabis and um, alcoholic beverages. Um, this law um, has particular importance for towns like Seaside Heights along the coast, but it also has importance for other towns and communities, especially those communities that have outdoor events or indoor events. I mean, as it stands now, the law provides that we can write a ticket for somebody smoking on the beach, but our law enforcement officers are completely powerless to enforce the cannabis and the alcoholic beverage provisions as to underage persons. So I was happy to read what I read, but the bill is, is wrong in so many other respects. And, and I'm hoping by, by mentioning this to you that you'll carry this to the governor's office on behalf of the mayor and council of Seaside Heights. The law criminalizes law enforcement conduct if the police officer, when making a split second decision, gets it wrong. Up to three to five years in state prison, loss of obviously a loss of a career at that point but another provision of the bill provides complete um, protection for dope dealers. Some dope dealer, some member of MS-13, a bicycle gang that's trying to get my kid or, or, or anybody's grandkid hooked on drugs. If that person gets caught doing that, that person gets a civil penalty of $250 for the first offense, $500 for the second offense. And then it's only a petty, petty disorderly person's offense for the third and subsequent violations. So there's many aspects of this law that, that really, really need to, to, to have another look. And, I, and I, would, I would urge also that it has input from the 564, five towns and 21 counties and all the school districts because we are the group, we are the people that have to deal with this on the ground. Um, and we're terrified, Lieutenant Governor, how this is gonna impact our beach and boardwalk in particular. Um, it's not always easy for a town like us when you have hundreds of thousands of people visiting your town. Law enforcement has a very tough job, um, and this just makes it, ver you know, uh, it compounds how difficult it is a hundredfold. I know there's, I know both parties are working on some, some amendments to this, but right now the only amend amendments I've seen have to do with the parental notification, and I'm hoping there will be a dialogue in closing to make some other changes to this, to this, this law. Thank you and have a great, great afternoon, Lieutenant Governor. Thank, thank, thank you, Christopher. And uh, I don't have to tell you the long and arduous journey and hours and days and meetings and backs and forths that all of us had uh, with, with these bills. And the, even, you know, as the citizenry of the state was making inquiry, we voted on this in November 67% of the people uh, approved the referendum. Why don't we see implementation? Well, we didn't see implementation for many of the reasons that you um, have just described and defined. Um, there are such a myriad of positions uh, and uh, points of view uh, on this legalization issue and the decriminalization aspect of cannabis legalization. And I'm sure you kept up with it every step of the way. I think what you saw the governor uh, uh, put a signature to is something that kind of met all stakeholders and parties along the way. Uh, I want you to know that law enforcement union leadership uh, was never taken out of the conversation and they were a strong stakeholder group in these discussions. Um, many of our legislators, uh, quite frankly, uh, held up moving towards implementation because of concerns around use and access to young people uh, of uh, you know, cannabis, alcohol as well. I pretty much would say, Christopher, that this is not the last time we will see this legislation be complete. I think that as we move into implementation, as law enforcement uh, begins to have on the ground experience in what has been enacted, I think you will see the legislature and the administration 
revisit a lot of the issues uh, that you raised. But you never know how things go from a policy making point of view, as I often say, until you deal with it grassroots on the ground. And I'm certain that uh, many of the issues you raised, particularly being for, at, in Seaside Heights and the shore communities are definitely a challenge. But it is, a, it is a challenge for the rural communities, the urbans, the seaside communities, the tourist uh, places. But um, this isn't the last we're gonna see of this legislation. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, the next question will be from Matt Watkins. Thank you, Governor. Um, Lieutenant Governor for being here, Matt Watkins from Bloomfield, your next door neighbor. <laughs> yes, hi, <I'm> Matt. <laughs> um, at least I'm the administrator for the next three weeks before oh. I join that group that retires. Oh. But I did want to uh, ask you about uh, the, the President Biden's uh, new uh, package. Um, we're very excited about it. We hear, you know, that we see some of the calculations of how that's going to go. I, um, I know that this is brand new, so how it comes through the state uh, is very critical. And, and on behalf of my colleagues who will have to deal with this issue, I, I just want to make one, two requests. One is that, you know, at least some, some people that uh, represented the NJMMA, I mean, we have some great people on the board um, uh, to be a part of that conversation, how this gets, how this is distributed and the controls that are put on it from the state. I know that's a very complex issue, but we're all waiting I know what Bloomfield's eligible to get and I can't wait for it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about it. And then the last thing is that, you know, we're, we're all trying to pass the budget and you mentioned it in, in your uh, discussion, how difficult this year is for the municipal budgets, um, trying to figure out COVID. You know, we took advantage of the revenue replacement because of our parking and water utilities. It's very complex for a budget year. And we don't wanna tax our people any more than we have to. So, you know, the DLGS has its deadlines and clearly it's going to be very difficult for towns to meet those deadlines. I just ask you as the commissioner to, to um, talk to the director about not coming down on the hammer us. Um, you know, we're trying to figure it out uh, and uh, it's going to be really, really tough to do that. And so that's my request on behalf of my colleagues. You all will have to deal with it, but I wanted to make that ask. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. It's always been so wonderful to work with you when you were my legislator in Clifton and as the speaker and everything like that. It's been wonderful. You're outstanding, and I'm so proud of you and to, to be able to say I know you. So thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, uh Congratulations on that retirement. But what I have learned about uh, municipal executives is they retire and then they do their second career. So congratulations on that. Um, interestingly, I'm glad you mentioned water because on the call we had this morning with the governor's office in DC, the uh, American Rescue Plan provides um, re resources for folks to pay their water and sewer bills. And I know that's gonna be a tremendous, tremendous thing for many of our municipalities. So I was glad that Congress, you know, even delved that deeply to understand at the local level, the implication that COVID has had. Um, I certainly am going to uh, ask Jacqueline to outreach to the association so that those kinds of conversations can be had. Uh, the point person in the governor's office that is working in tandem uh, on whatever uh, policies we're going to set up is Dennis Zeveloff. And I will ask uh, Jacqueline to maybe do um, and organize uh, through NJMAA uh, a Zoom call for administrators uh, to address the issue of flexibility in scheduling and uh, what we're thinking about on the administration side in terms of the process to flowing money down to the municipal level um, and get your input in terms of what works. 
but we are definitely not going to be rigid. We know that flexibility is needed. As a state, if we did not get flexibility from the feds, we would not have been able to accomplish what we've been able to accomplish thus far. So we can definitely make that happen. And I will speak to Jacqueline about that today. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. I certainly echo his sentiments with that. Yeah. Um, you know, so many of us are challenged and, you know, uh, it's it's really direct budgetary support that we're going to need, um, not more PPE. Correct. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to go to our organization's president, Ray Cody, with his question. Thank you, Jillian. And thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for uh, being part of the program today. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ray. This is Ray Cody from the Borough of Madison, the uh, the Lieutenant Governor's second favorite town after uh, East Orange. I'm coming. I'm coming there in a couple of weeks for a uh, historic trust grant purpose. I heard you're coming to our Museum of Early Trades and Crafts uh, with yeah. a fifty thousand dollar check. You're you're welcome even without a check. Always. <laughs> I, I had two two questions. W one relates to COA. Uh, obviously, it's a, a, a probably a, a top of everybody's list, right? Just behind the stimulus aid is COA and the potential for the state to reassert jurisdiction in that area. Currently, there are less than 10 towns left pursuing litigation. So it seems like the second round cycle is, has played out, but there's a third round coming in July of 2025. And I think I speak for a number of people who were probably participating today, requesting that the state try to explore taking that responsibility back that was abrogated under Governor Christie. And that's why the Supreme Court stepped in. We just think it's a much better planning process for towns and the funds that are currently being spent on legal fees and special masters and planners can be more appropriately uh, used to build the housing that everybody so desperately needs. So, so we encourage the state to explore that. That was one. And then I'm gonna ask the second question and then you can decide if you wanna respond. Is there's a bill working its way through the legislature uh, re requiring prevailing wage if there's a payment in lieu of taxes at any stage of the project that will have a significant adverse effect on the creation of affordable housing if right now the current structure is most of that construction is done at non-prevailing wage and then when the financing is converted to a permanent loan it converts to a, uh, a HMFA uh, long-term mortgage product uh, but it's done, built at a non-prevailing wage. Besides that, the impact would be on commercial projects throughout the state. And also I, I would pick an example of East Orange or Orange. I, I was a council president in Orange, city of Newark. They provide a significant number of five-year abatements to encourage homeowners to repair their homes and to not get hit immediately with a, a, an added uh, tax bill on those improvements as an incentive. That legislation would affect all of those. So all of that work and all of those in East Orange, Orange, Newark, anywhere those five-year abatements are done would have to be done at union prevailing wages. And very few homeowners think in those terms and it would just drive the cost up probably 20 to 25 to 30% of all of that residential improvements in those towns. It would drive up the cost of affordable housing and probably make some projects not feasible. And it would also impact the commercial revitalization that all of the towns need. Everyone's taken a hit on the revenue. So we're desperate for new rateables. So we don't need another rocket and roll down the hill to add a layer of cost to make a project that's probably questionable to begin with, not doable. So those are the two topics that I would hope that you would uh, consider uh, using your wisdom and come up with a better result than what currently is planned. So thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for participating today. Okay, thank you, Ray. And I'm going to address the second uh, question uh, comment first. Uh, you know, we at DCA and HMFA are certainly as concerned as you are in terms of our ability to keep production going and the cost. When we look at, for instance, our 4% tax credit program, our 9% tax credit, program, the other financing vehicles that we have within the HMFA, we know how we have limited capacity to produce what we could potentially produce because of the issue of prevailing wages. Um, you know that this has been an issue in the state of New Jersey probably since Washington sailed down the Delaware River. And, you know, we have often tried to strike a healthy balance. I don't know what the future of that legislation is going to be, 
I would suspect that mayors uh, all across the state um, are going to step forward to go on the record on positions on that bill, particularly, um, you know, uh, League of Municipalities and others. Uh, we have not engaged in in-depth discussions around that issue yet, that, that, that bill and the proposed legislation. We all know that it is going to particularly hamper uh, revitalization in our communities. And you're absolutely correct. We all know that we are, are, are the, the um, real estate market in Jersey is booming. Uh, people are coming into our state. They are buying residential properties. They are investing, you know, in renovation and rehabilitation. Uh, when you point out what is going on in East Orange, I mean, I've got so many New Yorkers surrounding me on my block, and I know that that is true of every other community as well. So, uh, Ray, I do think that we need to do a lot of advocacy around this issue. Uh, we, you know, we do not want to say we don't support uh, labor. But we also know we have to support economic growth uh, in our communities as well. Um, and we have to keep up the affordability of development of housing. Uh, and we have to continue to support those that want to come and invest in our communities. And it's a delicate balancing act. But I hear you, of course, coming out of the DCA hat, I'm looking to up production. And I'm looking at how to maximize the resources and the costs uh, that are that are involved, and um, you know, I've even heard heard these discussions coming out of the EDA side because you know now through their two programs, Emerge and Aspire, uh, you're going to see more opportunity for investment in housing development. And at the end of the day, we've got to maximize whatever resources we have. So I'm certainly going to continue to raise that issue up with with. Uh, with folks uh, and uh, those uh, you know that are working in legislative affairs in the governor's office, because that 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 is something that is of importance to us at DCA and HMFA as well. And then on the on the whole COA side, I appreciate um, you uh, raising up and putting on my radar that third tranche uh, that will confront us uh, and moving towards 2025. You're absolutely right. I know there are a lot of concerns uh, from communities about which way we're going to go forward. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that candidly, we haven't had much discussion in that vein uh, in Trenton. And I guess COVID pretty much just moved it aside a little bit. But I want to thank you for raising that issue. And I'm going to begin to raise it with others. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, our next question is from Corey Gallo. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Um, the really has to deal with the budget and the introductions as we're all getting close to introducing our budgets. Do you have any insight when the state will be rolling down the, uh, you know, the distribution packages from the stimulus package and all that aid and when it will be coming to us? Because, you know, my, my council's eager to introduce but I, I don't feel from our perspective, I don't know if it's the right thing to do when there is potential aid coming down and what those aid packages are gonna look like. So I was just kind of trying to get some insight onto when you foresee that happening. Thank you. I, I will respond Corey by saying, we're working to get our fingers on those resources out of federal agencies as quickly as possible. And what I will say to you is that, um, you know, we've, we've developed a great relationship with the Biden administration. Uh, we are on the phone daily uh, with the administration. They understand the urgency of getting that money in the street. And uh, we certainly are going to do all that we can uh, working with the feds to get those resources uh, you know, committed to the state and local levels so that you can move forward with your budgeting. We, I do know that there's a reluctance on the part of many governing bodies and administration to strike a budget without having the unknown and, and making decisions in, in a vacuum. But um, I would say it's gonna happen as quickly as possible. 
because we've gotten indications that we can begin to see the federal funds begin to flow to us, not in a 60 day period, but you know, hopefully if we can, we can see money start moving within the next 30 days. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I did get a question offline regarding, or it's probably more of a statement, uh, the, uh, the COVID vaccine access and uh, including municipal employees as uh, one of the groups that is uh, authorized to get vaccine in an early stage. As you know, municipal employees are as essential as the transportation workers and the farm workers and the, many of the others that have already been um, you know, allowed to get in line at this point. And you know, it's, it's very important to uh, understand that public workers, DPW, um, you know, a lot of our workers are in fact essential. So um, you know, to take that message back to whoever the decision makers are, uh, you know, to advocate for our, our employees being included in an earlier group would be very, very helpful. Because I know I've seen and heard that, that concern um, only, not only amongst my own employees, but also amongst other towns that have also shared questions here, here today. Uh, um, point, well, point well taken. And I'm certainly, I'm certain that uh, Commissioner Persicelli um, has, you know, developed a way in which to, to prioritize that. I know for myself at DCA, that was important to me because I have housing inspectors and I've got fire marshals and I've got other frontline um, uh, essential employees that are out there every day. And I'm very concerned about uh, their, their ability to be vaccinated as well. But uh, I think that something is coming down the pipe to address the public workers. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and the second question I have offline, uh, is there a website where uh, we can learn about or apply for the fellowship program that was talked about uh, early in your comments? Yes, New Jersey Department of Community Affairs, and then click the link for Division of Local Government Services. Okay, very it'll good. Be, it'll be there. Mm -hmm. All right, I very much appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions from uh, the attendees before we wrap up? I think I've caught all of the hands that were raised. Uh, I don't see any others. Uh, I, again, appreciate your time. Do you have any other parting words? No, I, I just want to uh, tell uh, everyone that uh, as public sector uh, workers, as we all are, uh, it's been extremely challenging for all of us. Uh, you're not out there in the hinterlands by yourself. Uh, we think about our municipalities and our counties every single day. And uh, at DCA in particular, we understand that every decision that we make has, uh, can have arduous implication for you. So we are very uh, open. We are very listening. We don't possess all the answers. Uh, and we uh, just want to encourage you to feel free to communicate with us about challenges that you see uh, out in the field. I know when I came to DCA, I, uh, in surveying my building, uh, I asked various divisions and employees, have you been to such and such place re recently? Uh, I encourage decision makers within the agency to get out of the office. Well, they've been, they've been working remotely, but to get out of the office, to get out on the ground, and to experience things at a grassroots level. It's a lot different sitting in a conference room or an office making decisions that have implication for those of you that have to implement policy uh, at a local level. So I want you to know that uh, we, are, we are open, we're not dra draconian, and please feel free to have that type of a collaborative uh, discourse with us. Thank you. Um, before we part, I did see one comment uh, typed in the Q and A. Uh, you know about seniors and vaccination. Uh, you know many of them are not computer savvy. They're over sixty-five. Their ability not only to schedule appointments but also to uh, get access to the vaccine, to travel to the vaccine sites, is very difficult. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what the state is doing to help bridge that gap? I absolutely will. And you know, that has been an issue for me from day one, because I guess having, uh, you know, been a legislator and doing constituent services and, 
you know, dealing with the various demographic groups. I knew from the very beginning, uh-oh, I just started thinking about all the constituents in my head that would not know how to turn on a phone or a laptop and navigate a website to try to find, first of all, the registration page, et cetera. So uh, yes, we have begun to deal with that. And that is why you've seen in the past few weeks, greater emphasis placed upon, first of all, outreaching and going to places where older adults live working with municipalities and nonprofit organizations and faith institutions in neighborhoods so that folks have access. Um, we know that the mega sites, you know, were the first places that uh, our older adults could go. My issue was, and I'm a resident of Essex County, mm -hmm. um, how do older adults get to Livingston, to the, exactly. the Steer site or get to the Kmart site uh, in in West Orange, that's that's just far into to to uh, that older adult community. So mm -hmm. as a result of that, you're beginning to see it on the ground. Uh, Essex, in my county, has done a great job. But just the other day, someone said to me, "Well, you know, we can get more appointments at Essex County College." And I said, "You know why you're probably not getting maximum utilization there?" because there's nowhere to park there. <laughs> so That's true. That's I think true. we have to be, I th we've learned a lot in this short period of time. Mm -hmm. I visited a Middlesex County mega site, quite an operation, 300 National Guard staffers there to help bulk it up. But I think the name of the game going forward is neighborhood-based and community-based vaccination sites. Mm -hmm. uh, there are volunteer, uh, uh, SWAT teams that are being put together to help um, those who are not computer savvy to make those types of appointments. And I think you're going to see us move more towards expanded capacity for telephone customer service right. uh, where folks can call in and do that. But thank you for raising that. That is an issue. You know, one of the things that people are citing repeatedly is that there's significant underutilization of the opportunity to be vaccinated by black and brown communities. And, you know, I always counter that by saying, I don't think there's the reluctance and we can't use Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks as the reason why folk aren't coming forward. It is having access yes. uh, to get the vaccine. And we are working on that. We're working with great partners and collaborators on the ground. So you will see uh, an easier uh, hoe for uh, those uh, vulnerable populations. I, I completely agree. I think I think it's access, it's transportation, it's Correct. you know the hours that the appointments are available. Not everybody can take a day off during the week to get a vaccine done. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to those opportunities expanding as as the vaccine availability is is out there. Um, I got another question. Uh, uh, the lab uh, that you mentioned, is that also available through the DCA website, the DLGS yes. website? Yes. If you go to the Division of Local Government Services and you can click the link for lab. Okay. Is there a specific contact or uh, do you just follow the link through the... Uh, you can just follow the link through. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, it'll good. identify a person. All right. Very good. I appreciate that. Uh, I have one more hand raised. Uh, Joe Shrilo. You're up. Thank you. Uh, Joe Cascolo, uh, business administrator from East Brunswick Township, the statistical center of New Jersey. Um, <laughs> we, and Julian was very nice to uh, put my, my question out to you. One of the issues we're having in Middlesex County, because we definitely bought into the New Jersey state concept of uh, registration and distribution of vaccines but we're seeing a disproportional set of people being selected. And there's a numerous amount of seniors over 65 that haven't gotten their number called yet and they got registered early on. And now they're calling the mayor's office and the senior center and so on. And we're maintaining a list, but you know they're not savvy enough as Julian had said to go to the CBS's, the Rite Aids in this, I think, 
Middlesex County bought into the state site very early on, but we're seeing many people appear at our vaccine site, our, at our community arts center um, that aren't up in years. You know, they're in their 20s and 30s. I don't know if they have underlying health conditions, but my concern is that senior population, I do not have a problem we're taking my senior buses and getting them to the back site in Edison or anything else. Um, but we need a better way uh, because they just continually are calling the mayor's office, our senior center uh, repeatedly. Is this, there's one gentleman I call literally every day. Huh. You know, I'm losing 20 minutes to a half hour. And I, and I say to him, listen, if there was a way for me to schedule you your appointment, uh, but it, you know, it's right across the street from your office, Joe. Why can't you get me in there? And we are not allowing anybody to cut the line, but it's purely coming from the state on their registrations. And they sit out there and they're, they're looking at people going in there and they're a lot younger. And now with teachers being allowed in and everything else, they're real concerned that they're never going to get in because they don't have the computer skills. And I constantly tell them to call the state hotline number, but I think they're getting tired of these calls from these people. We need to get them scheduled. We need to know that when they enrolled three or four weeks ago, why aren't they, why weren't they called up yet? We don't have good answers. And it really makes us look like we don't have our act together, the state and the county. And we do, we are running a great operation, but we need to get these seniors um, you know, vaccinated. Uh, my heart goes out to them. They've been locked up now for a year. Um, and Lieutenant Governor, anything you could do to maybe have the vaccine uh, 800 uh, center, you know, have these people to be able to call in and verify that they live in Middlesex County. There were some stupid mistakes, I will agree, by some of these people. They typed in their wrong birthday. Yeah. They didn't type in they, they mistyped or misspelled middle sex. So when they did get selected, it said, well, you can't go to a vaccine site in Middlesex County because you don't live there. Or they left the field blank, which then required them to call the vaccine hotline and spend you know, an hour and a half on hold to finally get an agent that said, I can't help you. It, it, it's not a good look, Lieutenant Governor. And we, we want to do the right thing for, for all our residents and especially the most vulnerable. So any, any help with getting that done in the short term, these people are tired of hearing after a year, uh, just wait another couple of weeks, wait another couple of weeks. If you could help us get us, uh, help them get vaccinated, it would be uh, greatly appreciated. And I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Joe. And, you know, I, I hear the same things that you hear echoed. Um, and, you know, I, 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 as you was talking, I, I was thinking through my head, there's a slogan where you know better, you do better. And I think that if the Department of Health and uh, our OIT operation in Trenton knew when they began to deal with a vendor to set up you know, an IT-based system of registration, uh, they could have avoided some of the pitfalls that have occurred. But I hear the exact same kinds of things that you do. I know the uproar when folks didn't feel that smokers should be a prioritized group. And, you know, I've, I've heard all of that as well. And, you know, I hear people who have registered uh, three months ago, but somebody who registered two weeks ago gets called to come get their vaccine. Um, we, we are aware of the problems and the impediments. I think we have learned a lot. I can tell you that uh, Commissioner Persicelli is working 24 seven to try to correct uh, and, and revise that. I think now that the CDC is making certain that more vaccine is flowing into the states, I think you will see a better situation uh, evolve. Because in the, in the first couple of weeks, the, the problem was we didn't have enough vaccine. Um, but with, uh, with Pfizer is now flowing it in and uh, as are Moderna, and now we've got the J&J, &J, I think you will see an improvement in access. 
um, but I am I am well aware of uh, some of the concerns that people have, and you know I do agree with you. It is extremely frustrating for people, and people feel that you know it's quote unfair. But we are working to try to remedy those things. Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for your time. I know you're very very busy. Uh, so we'll we'll end the program here, and uh, you know I want to thank everyone for attending and getting all this information. And again, it's great to see you, and hope to see you soon. You as well. Take care, everyone, and um, I wish everyone uh, Godspeed as we pull ourselves up out of this pandemic. Take care. Have a good one. Bye, bye, everyone.